So in this video, we're going to start talking about the angular spectrum, uh, also known as the interpretation of this value uh, kx, or this uh, spatial frequency that we've been dealing with so far. And we'd like to figure out how to, uh, how to interpret this, or how to make sense of what is, what is going on here, and what's going on with this optical transfer function h and this uh, minus j k x squared d over 2k term. So let's think first about some uh, signal. So let's say this is, just, this is a one-dimensional signal, uh, and let's call this x of t, for example, or uh, actually better, let's call this g of x. Uh, let's call this signal g of x, and this is our spatial coordinate x. And so g of x, might look like anything. I don't know. It might look like this uh, weird, weird signal. Uh, so it might have a bunch of spikes in it. It might look like anything. But we know from Fourier's theorem, uh, or from the Fourier transform, that we can build this signal out of a bunch of different sine waves of varying frequency. So maybe we've got a sine wave with this frequency, and we're going to add it to a sine wave of this frequency, and we're going to add it to a sine wave of this frequency. That I know that doesn't look like a sine wave. Pretend that's just a really high frequency sine wave. Now, eventually, if we add enough of these sine waves together, so if we sum a bunch of sine waves, uh, actually, let's, let's put the coefficient out front. If we sum a bunch of these sine waves with just the right weighting, uh, sine kx times n times x, uh, then we can reproduce our original signal, which was in red. And if the signal's aperiodic, this sum actually needs to become an integral. And what we are integrating over is known as the Fourier transform. So this is going to be g as a function of kx. That's analogous to our weighting coefficients, cn. Uh, but we, we also like working with complex exponentials instead of, uh, instead of sine waves, because it just makes the math so much easier. So instead of, uh, instead of working with sine waves, we're going to work with complex exponentials. But you can think of them in exactly the same way. They're just different frequencies being summed together. And so if we get these weightings just right, this g k of x, this will be uh, our, our original signal. We'll reproduce our original signal g of x. And if you haven't seen Fourier transforms before, I strongly recommend you take a course on them. Uh, because that will make understanding Fourier optics uh, possible and much, much more interesting. So now the question is, how do we tie this back to the transfer function h uh, and this weird complex exponential term here? Uh, well, instead of uh, on the drawing everything on the x-axis, now I'm going to draw it on the y-axis. But this is still our function, g of x, and it's now some, uh, it's now got maybe an aperture in it. So this is our aperture function, g of x. And we're trying to reconstruct this with a bunch of different sine waves. So a bunch of different uh, sine waves along this axis. So this is the uh, x-axis. And to figure out just what sine waves we'd need, all we need to do is take the Fourier transform of g of x, or the integral from minus infinity to infinity of g in, or let's just keep calling this g of x, uh, e to the minus j k x times x dx. And so we could figure out this weighting, this appropriate uh, weighting of complex exponentials and sinusoids that we need uh, to reproduce our aperture function g of x. But how do we actually get these complex exponentials? So how do we actually get these things that look like sinusoids at this plane? Uh, so at this, let's call this the z equals zero plane. Well, you might say, well, I mean, all you need is a bunch of different plane waves of different frequencies propagating in this direction, so propagating down. And so you might have one plane wave with a relatively low frequency, like this guy here. You might have pl one plane wave uh, with a really high frequency. And you could, decom you could indeed decompose your signal uh, into a bunch of those plane waves, or decompose your aperture function into a bunch of different frequency plane waves. Uh, propagating along the x-axis. And so you'd write these as, for example, actually we're, we're going to use complex exponential notation. You'd write these as e to the j uh, k, let's call this, uh, well, kx times x minus omega t. 
So a bunch of propagating plane waves should give you what you need. The problem with that is that each of these sine waves uh, not only has a different spatial frequency k, but also has a different temporal frequency w. So this pattern that you form at this plane will change with time. Uh, so it might initially look like this rectangular aperture, but eventually it'll smear out and become something that you, you don't want it to be. So this is not an ideal way of decomposing our aperture function. We, we would like to use uh, a bunch of plane waves with the same frequency omega so that our pattern is not a function of time. So let me just, uh, well, actually, let's, let's go, down, go down below. Uh, so you might say, well, how, do, how on earth do I do that? How do I use just a single omega or equivalently just a single wave number k to represent a bunch of different kx values? That doesn't seem to make any sense. It seems like we should need uh, a bunch of plane waves of a bunch of different frequencies. Um, but the answer turns out to be really clever. You can make a bunch of different, uh, let's call them apparent, uh, I, I'll call them apparent f different frequency plane waves by taking one plane wave and tilting it. So if you were to tilt a plane wave with some wavelength lambda, uh, and you were just to slice it along the x-axis, so this plane wave is some e to the j uh, k vector dot r minus omega t, and we're, good, we're just going to drop all the omega t's now because they're going to be identical from one plane wave to the next. So we can just write this wave vector k as some initial value. So the, the k vector in the x component, kx is just k times sine of theta, where let's say this is uh, theta is just our tilt angle. And then the z component is just k times cosine of theta. So if we slice this along the x-axis, so we take r is just equal to x comma zero, so we take it at the z equals zero plane, then this uh, equation just becomes e to the j k times sine theta times x. And this, this is kx. So this is e to the j kx times x. And if we vary theta, we can get pretty much whatever k we want. So let's say that we're interested in a really low frequency plane wave. So we want a plane wave uh, along the x-axis that looks something like this. It's really slowly varying. Uh, then all we need is a really, really narrow tilt. So if we have a really, really narrow tilt, then one crest of the wave is going to be here. Uh, one is going to be here. And so this, this plane wave will actually look something like this something like that, uh, and this kx will be an extremely small value. And if you tilt this even less, uh, you can eventually make just a DC plane wave, or a plane wave with just constant amplitude. And so you can manipulate this theta to give you whatever kx you want. Now there's one caveat, uh, and you might have noticed this, that's that uh, let's say that I want a really high frequency plane wave, well, if I have just one k vector that I'm using, or I have just one spatial frequency, so this is just two pi over lambda, there's a maximum, uh, there's a maximum frequency that I can achieve on the x-axis, and that's if the plane wave is propagating in this direction. The minimum wavelength, or the maximum kx I can get, is just k, or two pi over lambda, and so let's call this kx maximum. But this isn't this this seems to be a problem, but it's actually a really interesting uh, this has really interesting consequences. And that's that if your pattern, so if g of x uh, has some very sharply varying features, so let's say your g of x looks like this, uh, your g of x looks like this, and you propagate it, those features will actually disappear as you propagate them. And the reason is that to get these features, you actually need your angle theta to become complex. Uh, or equivalently, you need this kx number to be imaginary. And you'll end up with exponentially decaying plane waves. So something that looks like e to the minus alpha uh, x, or actually e to the minus alpha z. So these super high frequency components, which are uh, 
more more rapidly varying than your wavelength we're assuming that you're illuminating the system with some wavelength lambda if you have features much more much more uh quickly varying than lambda they're not going to propagate they're going to sort of get attenuated or smushed out and intuitively you can kind of think this think of this as limiting the resolution of your system so you can't get infinitely fine features to propagate through an optical system and uh, we know this just from basic diffraction if we have uh, a an optical system it's going to have an airy pattern or uh, an airy disc and if we have two airy discs right next to each other we're not going to be able to tell them apart so easily and that's sort of that's not equivalent to this but it's a uh, it's another way of demonstrating that our resolution of our optical system is inherently limited by this wavelength. And so we can interpret this g in, or this g, this aperture function Fourier transform, as an angular spectrum. So we have, in order to make a certain pattern, a certain aperture function, we need a bunch of plane waves uh, with a bunch of different angles. And maybe some angles are really shallow, maybe some angles are really steep. But we need a bunch of different plane waves, and we need to sum them all up, or equivalently, uh, if this is aperiodic, integrate them. Uh, so we need to integrate their weightings times e to the j k z, or sorry, not not k z, k x times x d k x, and so this will give us back our original aperture function. So we're just combining a bunch of plane waves of a bunch of different tilts uh, which act like different frequencies if we cut them along the x-axis because we're interested in how things propagate from one plane to another plane so we can make a bunch of different frequencies by tilting a plane wave a bunch of different directions so you can also think of this g of kx as a g of theta or since kx is k times sine theta uh, g of k times sine theta so these two are equivalent, or rather stronger than that. They are actually equal. Now for this, we kind of have to let theta be complex because we want to be able to phase shift uh, these waves by a little bit. So kx is really a, a, more, a more easy to wrap your head around um, uh, concept once we start to have to deal with uh, complex quantities. But this, uh, this concept, I think, is intuitively much more easy to grasp, or at least much more physically satisfying, because it corresponds to some physical reality, which is plane waves tilted at different angles. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you did, please give it a like down below and subscribe to my channel. Uh, also, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to post those down below, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And thanks for watching. Bye.